The world is in desperate need of a different leadership role model. Pick up any daily newspaper, and you'll quickly find examples of abandoned values, betrayed trust, exploitation, and manipulation committed by people of power and influence. Corporate leaders exploit privileges of position, bringing ruin to employees and investors. Meanwhile, citizens of underdeveloped countries languish in poverty and hopelessness in a leadership vacuum. Church leaders experience crises of integrity, compromising their churches and breeding skepticism and disillusionment. Families and personal relationships drift away from mutual commitment and head towards battlegrounds of self-absorbed conflict over rights to individual fulfillment. In one sense, the leadership model that people often experience is summarized by the popular It's All About Me. In all kinds of organizations and institutions, the rewards of money, recognition, and power increase as you move up the hierarchy. Self-promotion. Pride. Self-protection. Fear. These are the reigning motivations that dominate the leadership landscape. Many leaders act as if the sheep are only there, are only there for the benefit of the shepherd. In personal relationships, leadership expectations of mutual respect, loving care, self-sacrifice, and openness are often undermined when pride, fear, and indifference replace intimacy with isolation. The good news is, there's a better way. There's one leadership role model you can trust. Jesus. There is a way to lead that honors God and restores health and effectiveness to organizations and relationships. It is the way Jesus calls us to follow as leaders, to serve rather than be served. As you begin your journey of leading like Jesus, you have to answer the following three key questions, which we'll explore further. Number one is, am I a leader? Question two, am I willing to follow Jesus as my leadership role model? And three, if so, how do I do it? How do I lead like Jesus would? Starting with the first question, am I a leader? Leadership is a process of influence. Anytime you seek to influence the thinking, behavior, or development of people in their personal or professional lives, you are taking on the role of a leader. Leadership can be as intimate as words of guidance and encouragement, or as formal as instructions passed through lines of communication inside corporations or organizations. Leadership can be nurturing the character, the self-worth in children, and promoting greater intimacy and fulfillment in personal relationships, or it can involve distributing diverse resources in an organization to accomplish a specific objective or task. Each of the following situations describes someone engaged in an act of leadership. A mother with a child at any time of day a friend who risks alienation to confront a moral failure, a corporate executive who rejects offers of inside information, 
a U.S. Navy SEAL commander who orders his troops into harm's way to succeed in their mission. A husband and wife who seek mutual agreement on day-to-day -day finances. A middle school teacher who excites curiosity in the minds of her students. A rehabilitation nurse who patiently handles the anger of a stroke victim. A missionary doctor who refuses to leave his patients to avoid capture by enemy forces. A local pastor who avoids teaching on controversial issues for fear of rejection. A high school coach who fails to confront rule violations by his star player. An adult who provides advice and guidance on living arrangements to his aging parents. A terminally ill patient who demonstrates grace, confidence, and courage to anxious loved ones. A local government official who takes an unpopular political stand based on solid principle. Or a dictator who hoards millions of dollars while his citizens are starving. Two things are evident in this list. First, each of these people is a leader because he or she is affecting or influencing others, either in a positive or in a negative way. This list reveals that some leadership actions are very specific in nature, such as the dictator hoarding millions. Others are more general, a mother with a child. Some are very overt, like an official taking an unpopular stand, and some are subtle and covert, a pastor avoiding teaching on a controversial issue. The actions of a leader that create influence are not always obvious to those who are being led. We also influence people who may not choose to follow, such as the executive who refuses the insider information. Second, these leaders are involved in making a personal choice about how and to what end they will use their influence. It's the same choice we are all called to make when we exert influence on people. Do we seek to serve or to be served? If your driving motivations are self-promotion, self-protection, you will use your influence with others to fulfill those needs. If your actions are driven by service and dedication to a cause, then you will model and encourage those values in others. As you think about the many ways which you influence the actions of other people, you can see that you are a leader wherever you go not just at work, not just at temple. Whether you serve others as parent, spouse, family member, friend, or even citizen, or whether you have a leadership title and position like CEO, assistant pastor, lead coach, teacher, manager, you are a leader. As we consider how we can lead like Jesus in our various leadership roles, we do need to be aware of the difference between life role leadership and organizational leadership. Life role leadership functions in enduring relationships, focuses on growing and developing people, and supporting mutual commitment in relationships. It involves seasons of personal sacrifice to promote the spiritual and physical well-being of others. It's based on duty, honor, and lifelong obligation. It's resilient, based on the levels of relational commitment. It anticipates love and loyalty, 
trust and mercy, forbearance, forgiveness, and sacrifice. It is seasonal in levels of influence, based on maturity and growth over time. It values love, compassion, trust, commitment, honesty, and grace. Comparatively, organizational leadership involves positions and titles bestowed at the convenience of the organization to serve the perceived needs and culture of the organization. Measured accountability for long and short-term results under constant scrutiny by a variety of stakeholders. Organizational leadership is also at risk based on performance and preferences of governing bodies and stakeholders. It's about power and influence. It's prone to conflicting agendas and priorities. Sensitive to shifts in organizational structure, standards, and priorities. Reward is delivered in the form of additional power, material rewards, recognition. It operates in the realm of competition and marketplace standards and biases. It values competence, material results, diligence, conviction, confidence, integrity, and vision. The most dramatic differences between life role leadership and organizational leadership involves the permanence of the relationships the leader is trying to influence. Life role leaders function in enduring lifelong relationships as parents, spouses, siblings, friends, citizens, where duty and obligation cannot be easily relinquished or discarded. Organizational leaders, on the other hand, operate for a season in an environment of temporary relationships and constant change. People in positions come and go in organizations for all sorts of reasons. Whom you will be working with or for can change in an instant. This lack of stability often breeds a degree of reserve and qualified commitment acted out in the arena of competitive office politics. Most of the leadership that shapes our lives does not come from leaders with titles on an organizational chart. It comes from leaders in our daily life role relationships. It is instructive to note that in the early church, a candidate's life role relationship, his life role leadership, was a prerequisite for assuming any organizational leadership. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 1, we read, Here is a trustworthy saying, If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife must be temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. He must also have a good reputation. He must not be a recent convert either, for he may become conceited and fall under the same temptation as the devil. One person who exemplified servant leadership in Jesus' life was his mother Mary. The legacy of obedience, submission, faith, and service that Mary passed on to her son is the subject of a rich heritage that we will not venture into at this time. But Mary epitomized the essence of a servant's heart. In her life, and her role as mother. She was positioned to have strategic influence on the life and spirit of her child. The relationship between mother and son, between a soul already tested and found willing, and with one 
to be nurtured between spiritual teacher and student. This was part of God's plan, plan of preparation for Jesus' season of leadership. Take a moment to think about the people who have most influenced your thinking, your behavior, your life path. As you recall their names and faces, you will realize that leadership, titles and positions of organizational authority, are only part of the leadership landscape. Now think of all the relationships in which you have the opportunity to influence the thinking and behavior of others. And consider how often in any given situation you face the choice. Am I seeking to serve or to be served? The answer to that question will depend on who we choose to follow, which leads into the second question. Am I willing to follow Jesus as my leadership role model? You might say, wait, before I look to Jesus as my leadership role model, I need to understand what leading like Jesus means. The essence, the core concept of leading like Jesus, is encapsulated in the not-so-with-you mandate that Jesus gave his disciples regarding how they were to attain and carry out roles of leadership. In Matthew 20 we read, Jesus called them together and said, You know the rulers, how they, the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority and lord it over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you, must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. This call by Jesus to servant leadership is clear and unequivocal. His words leave no room for plan B. He placed no restrictions or limitations on time, place, or situation that would allow for us to exempt ourselves from his command. For followers of Jesus, servant leadership isn't an option. It's a mandate. Servant leadership is to be a living statement of who we are in Christ, how we treat one another, and how we demonstrate the love of God to the whole world. If this sounds like serious business with profound implications, it is. The exciting part of leading like Jesus is that he never sends us into any situation alone or with a flawed plan, never with a plan to fail. Jeremiah chapter 29 tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. As in all things, when Jesus speaks to us about leadership, he speaks about what is right and effective. We can trust his word as an expression of his unconditional love and sacrifice for our eternal well-being. As followers of Jesus, we can trust him regardless of our circumstances, and we can freely ask God to give us wisdom in all things, including our leadership roles. James chapter 1 reminds us that Jesus wants to be intimately involved in all aspects of our life. 
friend of ours once had a counselor who kept reminding him, Your intelligence has gotten you into this. In other words, in a variety of situations, he thought he was smart enough to figure it out on his own. But he wasn't. He was trying to play for the approval of all kinds of audiences. Many of whom had conflicting views of what he ought to be doing and how he ought to be living. He ended up pleasing none of them. He had yet to learn that he had but one audience, and that truly is God. In fact, God is not only the audience, but the director. God will guide and direct us to do exactly the right thing, if only we will let him. Let's pause to ask, is Jesus a relevant role model for us today? A common barrier to embracing Jesus as a leadership role model lies in skepticism about the relevance of his teaching to our modern-day situations. We are in many ways faced with the same questions that Peter faced when Jesus asked him to do some highly unusual and unorthodox things regarding his fishing business. Here was the situation as described in Luke 5, 1. One day Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. A great crowd pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon Peter, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now, go out where it is deeper and let down your nets. You will catch many fish. Master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, we'll try again. This time their nets were so full they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the size of their catch, as were the others with him. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they had landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. What do you think was going through Peter's mind when he replied, Master, we have been fishing all night and we haven't caught a thing. Sounds like he might have been thinking something along the lines of, I've been listening to Jesus address the crowds with great power and wisdom. I really respect him as a teacher and for his knowledge of God's word, but now he's asked me to do something that goes totally against my knowledge of how to run my fishing business. He doesn't know fishing. I know fishing. It's my business, and this is not a practical plan. If I do what he says, it's probably going to be a waste of time and energy. My workers are going to wonder if I've lost my mind. Peter's skepticism, however, did not prevent him from taking a leap of faith because of who gave him the instructions. Because of his faith, he experienced miraculous results, and he was overwhelmed by what he perceived was too great a gap between himself and what Jesus would expect of him. Jesus sought to calm Peter's doubts, to calm his fears, and issued an invitation to come and be transformed for a higher purpose. He is issuing the same call.